good morning, good morning, good morning. That was absolutely glorious, Kelly and the choir. Thank you so much. Uh, so many voices in the choir this morning. I mean, we haven't had that many in seven months, and oh, it makes a difference, doesn't it? Every single voice that gets added to our choir, every single voice that you lift up, it makes a difference, and it's beautiful, and it is gorgeous. So thank you so, so very much. Well, if you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, we're going to be looking at verses 36 through 41. Acts chapter 15, verses 36 through 41. And while you're turning there, just a couple of quick announcements. As Kelly said, uh, it's the small things, right? The bulletin's back. Uh, it's been seven months since we had a bulletin. I'm, it's, it's simple, but I'm excited about it. I'm glad it's here. There's information in there that you should know, and now you can read it. Uh, so uh, there are a few announcements. Of course, we have our senior adult bingo returning every Tuesday, uh, second Tuesday at 10 a.m. So that's very exciting. So come and be a part of that. Uh, there's also a, uh, a, a guest information card and a prayer request card in there. And let me just say this. If you've been a guest with us over these past seven months and never filled out one of these, I would love for you to fill that out. Even though you're not a guest anymore, you, you are, uh, I mean, you are a guest, but you are a regular now. But fill that out so that we have a record of your visit. And if you're online, please let us know that you're here. Say hello and uh, put your name and tell us where you're from. A couple other quick uh, announcements. Tonight at 6.30 p.m., as you recall, last week we had a business meeting and the church voted to expand music director role to become director of music and online ministries. Our candidate for that role will be here tonight uh, at 6.30 p.m. and he will be leading us in worship. So this is an opportunity for you to come and meet the candidate, hear from him, and uh, uh, you know just get to know him and his family. So uh, come out tonight at 6.30 p.m. and hear him. And then next Sunday, October 11th, we will have a called business meeting where we will vote on that candidate. Uh, a couple other quick announcements. Sunday school continues to expand. Thankful for that. We have our 930 all adult Sunday school class in here taught by Miss Joyce, Brother Mark, and uh, Brother Sam. And that's kind of a lecture style. And uh, we've got two other classes now that have started up. One at 10 a.m. taught by uh, uh, Brother Don. And he's down in the fellowship hall. And that's more of a social distance Sunday school class. And many of our senior adults are going there if you'd like to be a part of that. And then now a new one starting up on October 18th uh, is going to meet down in the Covenant Journey class. It's going to be taught by Brother Keith, uh, Brother Henry, and also Brother Sam. And that's going to be more of a discussion-based Sunday School class. So if you enjoy uh, discussing and digging in things together, come and be a part of that. All right, a lot of things that are going on. But as you've turned in your Bible today, I've titled the sermon, Overcoming Christian conflict, overcoming Christian conflict. There's an old saying about us Baptists. It says this, wherever two or three Baptists are gathered together, there will be 17 opinions in their midst. And we Baptists have been famously uh, a, a group of um, opinionated individuals. Uh, and, and the same goes true for Christians. Unfortunately, we as Christians tend to disagree a lot. If you go through the New Testament and look at the letters, so often a major theme in these New Testament letters is unity, coming together of being of the same mind and the same heart. In fact, as Paul is writing in 1 Corinthians, it practically starts off this way with him saying, stop fighting with one another, be unified. And as we go through our text today, we're going to be looking at one very specific moment were two men who were very close to each other, had a very divisive moment. And in fact, leading up to that, if you go through the rest of Acts 15, you see that the church is coming together with a divisive moment where they have to have the Jerusalem council decide how are they going to bring Gentiles into their midst? How are they going to worship? So we tend to fight. And unfortunately, that hasn't stopped even to today. And brothers and sisters, we are right now, unfortunately, Dividing along a perilous fault line when it comes to this election. We are only four weeks away and we are becoming a very divided nation. Seems we are no longer the United States of America, we are the divided states of America. And it's spilling over into the church. And we have begun to lose discourse and reconciliation one with another. And it does not matter what side of the political aisle you are on, 
We need to love one another and listen to one another and care for one another. So the question for us today is how do we handle disagreements? Are all disagreements bad? And how do we fix them? And that's what we're going to be looking at in the text today. So if you have found Acts chapter 15, verses 36 through 41, and you are able, will you please stand with me in the honor of the reading of God's word? God's word says this. After some time had passed, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the brothers and the sisters in every town where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take along John Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take along this man who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone on with them on the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed off to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed after being commended by the brothers and the sisters to the grace of the Lord. He traveled through Syria and Sicilia and strengthened the churches. Let's pray. Mighty Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for this day and this opportunity to be gathered in your house, to be gathered as brothers and sisters united under the name of Jesus Christ and under that precious blood that has saved us and made us new. Father, we are no longer Jews nor Gentiles, slave nor free, male nor female, but we are all one in Jesus Christ. Father, I pray by your Holy Spirit you would unite us. Lord, by your word this morning, it would penetrate our hearts. And Father, if we have anyone in our life that we need to reconcile with, Father, draw us to them so that we may be reconciled. Now, Father, I pray that you would move, you would speak and move me out of the way so that, Father, the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. O oh, Lord, my rock and my redeemer, I pray this in the blessed name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. So as we go through the text today, I want to point out three things, but in order to do so, we kind of have to do a little bit of time traveling. We're going to go into the past, into the present, and then into the future of these two men, Paul and Barnabas. But the first thing I want to share with you is this, a foreboding friction, a foreboding friction. If you look in verses 36 through 38, what you see is that uh, Paul and Barnabas have just come from the Jerusalem Council, and they are after their first missionary journey, and Paul has reached out to Barnabas and said, let's go back. Let's go back to all the churches that we've been to, and let's strengthen and let's encourage them. And Paul, Barnabas is all about it. This dream team of these uh, missionary apostles going out, and Barnabas is like, yes, let's do it. Let's take along John Mark. Paul's like, nope, 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 we're not doing that. We are not taking John Mark. Of course, this begins to cause some friction. But just like in all things in life, and maybe it is with us as believers, not all things just happen. And there's just suddenly a fight. No, there's been friction that's been building over a little bit of time. And to order to understand that, we need to go back and look. Because we focus so much on Paul and Barnabas, but this young man, John Mark, he's throughout all the New Testament in various places, and we need to kind of an understanding of why Paul is reacting the way he is. So we go back to Acts 12, 25, and what we see in that moment is that Paul and Barnabas have been bringing famine relief to Judea, and they are returning from that, but they brought along John Mark with them. So John Mark has been on at least one journey with them as they've gone to serve the churches. So this is early in their career together, and John Mark, as we will learn from Scripture, is the cousin to Barnabas. We see that in Colossians 4.10. He's the cousin to Barnabas, but he is also the son of Mary. And Mary was the woman who held the, the church together in her house as Peter was in jail. If you remember a few weeks back when we were looking at that, all the believers in Jerusalem gathered in Mary's house and were praying for Peter. And John Mark was amongst them because that's his house too. So we see that John Mark is very much involved in the church and has seen the wonder working of God as Peter has been rescued. Then as we flash forward a little bit more in Acts 13, 
Paul and Barnabas begin on their first missionary journey and they go and they're going out into a brave new world and taking the gospel to the Gentiles and John Mark goes with them. But then suddenly something happens and John Mark skips out on the trip. In fact, when they go to Pamphylia, as Paul says, when they get to Perga there, John Mark goes home. Now there's no elaboration on that. But he gets off the boat and he gets back on a different boat and he goes to Jerusalem. He's done and he leaves the mission just really as it's starting. And of course, this discourages Paul because now they're a man down. And not only that, John Mark has abandoned what they've been called to do. But then later, even after this moment, after the Jerusalem council, they Go back to Antioch, but there Peter comes to visit. And when Peter comes to visit, he's eating with the brothers there at Antioch. But then some men, it says, comes from Jerusalem. It says they are of James and they're Jewish, these Judaizers. And they come into the midst of this crowd. And and Peter suddenly decides to go and eat with them, abandoning the Gentiles. And this makes Paul furious. And he confronts Peter to his face. And he says, even in the midst of this, Peter's hypocrisy was so great, Paul says, that even Barnabas submitted to it and went and sat with Peter, abandoning the Gentiles. So there's been this simmering friction between these two men that's been going on. It's wrapped up in John Mark, but also wrapped up in... Barnabas beginning to go and sit with the Jews. And so this issue with John Mark is such a big deal to Paul for this reason. You can actually see it in the language of verse 38. It says, but Paul insisted that they should not take along this man who had deserted them in Pamphylia. Deserted them. That language that's being used there to desert the work is to say, Essentially, that John Mark rejected the call of God on his life. The church has laid hands on these men. They have commissioned these men. They are to do the Lord's work. And John Mark, for whatever reason, has deserted the work of God. And so Paul sees that John Mark has abandoned the very call that God has placed on him. For him... This carries a tremendous amount of weight. If John Mark will reject the call, he has rejected it for good. And so Paul says, no, we don't bring them. So there's been a foreboding friction in the life of Barnabas and Paul. But then the second thing I want us to see in the text today is this. A furious fracture. A furious fracture. Look at verse 39. It says, they had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company And Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed off to Cyprus. This disagreement about John Mark was so large that it caused a sharp disagreement. And these two friends, not only friends, more than friends, a mentor and a mentee, people who have been in the fire together, they've been on the front lines, they've been hurt, they've been beat, they've seen the joys of the gospel spread, these two men are now separating. And this word sharp disagreement means to provoke to anger. This argument that they have about John Mark is so great, both men are furious. And they separate one from another. And Luke, under the supertension of the Holy Spirit, uses this beautiful word of sharp disagreement because this disagreement is so hot and is so angry, it cuts like a knife. Two men that were inseparable now move on to different missions. Paul takes Silas and goes back to the churches, and Barnabas takes John Mark and heads to Cyprus. One goes one way, one goes the other. Let me give you some observations about this when we look at a furious fracture from this word. The first observation is this. God wants us to see this conflict. He wants us to see what happened to them. It's important enough that the Lord has made sure that it is immortalized in 
Scripture, warts and all, nothing is hidden so that we see the anger between these two men. Why? Why do this? So that we can learn from it. We can see how two Christian brothers come to a disagreement and then reconcile. The Lord wants us to see this. The second observation is this. Luke does not focus on what was said between the two men. The language of their argument is not recorded. Only the substance of their argument is. We know why they had an argument. We know why they got mad. But we do not have the language of what they said. Because Luke understands what was said is not important. What was said is not important. And for us, it's important for us to know when we begin to have arguments one with another, we need to be careful on what we say to each other. We'll see that in just a moment about slandering and, and, and tearing each other down. We need to be careful what we say, but we also need not hang on what the other person was saying in their anger. Third observation is this. Luke does not focus on who was right or wrong. And that's interesting. Luke does not focus on who was right or wrong. We want to have a victor in this, right? We want to know who was the most correct. Was, was Barnabas right? Because John Mark had potential. And as we're going to see in just a moment that yes, John Mark had amazing potential. Should the great son of encouragement, Barnabas, not grab another person and say he needs to be lifted up in the mission? He needs the experience. He's young. He's immature, but he needs to go. Was Paul correct? John Mark may not have had the maturity to do this again. He obviously didn't have the maturity to do it the first time. Maybe he's going to do it again. See, in this case, what's going on is both sides had a good argument as to why they took the position they did. See, discourse like this, where both sides have a good argument, is being lost in America and it's being lost in the church. We are taking the position as if you go against me, you're automatically wrong, your opinion is wrong, the words that you have are not valid, and you need to be quiet and never speak again. We live in a cancel culture. So the immediate thing is, is I cancel you. You think different from me. But what we see here is that actually both men were right. And as we move forward, don't look at the text and say, okay, the brothers commissioned Paul to go and do this. Ergo, they said he must be right. No, what's happened is John Mark is, or Barnabas has taken John Mark to Cyprus where Barnabas comes from and he's going to raise him up and Paul's being commissioned to continue the missionary journey. Both men are right. So Luke does not focus on who was right or wrong. And the fourth thing is this. There was much fruit yielded from these two men splitting up. There was much fruit yielded from this. In fact, as we see, churches were strengthened on both ends. Paul takes Silas and strengthens the churches. Barnabas takes John Mark, and as we're going to see in a moment, this, the churches are strengthened through their efforts as well. And not only that, two young disciples are built up. Paul now pours into Silas, and Silas becomes a, a powerful man in the church. And Barnabas will pour into John Mark, and John Mark will become a very useful man in the church. So some splits can be good and God can use them to bear much fruit. Now, the Lord has never called us to split in anger. He's called us to multiply. And so he may uh, use a division to continue multiplication. But this does not mean even if God can use it and we can see a split and a division as fruitful that does not mean that believers are to stay mad at one another. Just the opposite. Believers are to reconcile. And we see that in the third thing I would like to look at. A fixed future. A fixed future. So we have gone from a foreboding friction to a furious fracture to a fixed future. And so now we need to look at what comes next. Because reconciliation is desperately important. In fact, 
Paul says we as believers have the ministry of reconciliation. And so the disagreement between these two men did not last. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 9, 6, which comes later, Paul is writing to the Corinthian church and he commends Barnabas after their time apart and says, Barnabas is worth the support financially that you pour into him. He is a man worthy of the work and worthy of the income that you send to him. So Paul lifts up Barnabas in that letter. We will see in Colossians 4.10 that Paul recommends John Mark to the church. And from that letter, it is obvious that John Mark is now with Paul. So as time has progressed, John Mark becomes a, a man of mission and is once again reunited with Paul, so much so that Paul recommends to the church, use John Mark, he is valuable. 2 Timothy 4.11, later on in Paul's life, Paul asked for John Mark to be sent to him as he is in prison. For this reason, he says, for John Mark is very useful to me for the ministry. So this reconciliation between Barnabas has now been a reconciliation between Paul and John Mark to the point where Paul says, John Mark is valuable to me. But not only that, John Mark becomes a protege to Peter. Peter writes in 1 Peter 5.13, he's giving greetings to the church as he's closing out this letter. He says, greetings to you, and he ends with saying, my son Mark greets you as well. And he's speaking of John Mark. And when he says my son, he means my spiritual son. John Mark has come to me, and Peter is invested in him. And so now... Peter and John Mark have a Barnabas and Paul relationship, so much so that John Mark becomes desperately important to Peter. Now, where is there any other place that you've heard the name Mark? That's right. John Mark wrote the Gospel of Mark. And some theologians believe that the Gospel of Mark is the first Gospel to be written and passed around to the churches. So a young man who was at the center of a sharp disagreement between Paul and Barnabas becomes a man whose name is on a gospel, one of only four authors that we still have in our canon today. This shows us so many things. It shows us the power of reconciliation between Christian brothers, whereas one thought this man is useless. And so when his separate ways reaches back out and through that there's a reconciliation. I can only imagine Barnabas, the son of encouragement, reaches out to his brother Paul and says, Paul, I'm sorry. And Paul, as we can see in these letters, as he writes such words to the church to say, oh, Barnabas, I am so sorry. Send John Mark to me. Paul is about reconciliation and from that John Mark is strengthened so there's another sidebar on this we must never discount anyone in the church as useless to us for God may be stirring in them to go and empower and encourage the church through their writings through their efforts through the support of great missionaries and they may have been to us someone of No value. But this shows so desperately the power of reconciliation. From a fracture to a fixing, all through Jesus Christ. And not only that, a great multiplication that to this day we are beneficiaries of. So I close in this. I want to look at the wrong ways to have a disagreement and then how we can be reconciled unto each other. The wrong ways to have a disagreement, first of which is this, don't bring the world into it. Don't bring the world into your argument. We have a tendency to do that, to reach out to our friends and say, speak into this. But we are cautioned, don't do that. Bring it before your brother. In fact, 1 Corinthians 6, 1 through 8, Paul is speaking to the church and he says, 
about lawsuits, why would you ever go to a secular judge who is trying to destroy the church anyway to weigh on your matters? Oh, believers, are there not any wise amongst you that have the Spirit of God that can speak into your disagreement? If you have a disagreement with a brother, don't take it to the world, take it to the church. There are wise people in the church that can help speak into that. The second thing is this, is don't speak evil. I told you Luke doesn't focus on the words. Don't speak evil about that person. Don't criticize them. Don't slander them. James 4, 11 through 12 says this, don't criticize one another, brothers and sisters. Anyone who defames or judges a fellow believer defames and judges the law. If you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There's one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Ephesians 4.31, let all bitterness, anger, and wrath, shouting and slander be removed from you. Along with all malice, there's Paul writing to the church. Get rid of that junk when it comes to each other. If you remember when I was preaching on Ephesians last year, in that same chapter in verse 7, when it speaks of slander, it's in reference to the devil. It says the devil is the one that slanders us. And Paul is saying right there in Ephesians 4.31, don't be the devil to your brother. The devil's slandering you enough. You don't need to be on his side. You don't need to be his tongue. Stop slandering your brother. So then, how do we reconcile one with another? Our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, tells us in Matthew 5, 23 and 24. And I am sure that Paul and Barnabas did this. I'm sure this is how this went. For both men, very godly, would follow this. Matthew 5, 23 and 24 says, So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled with your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Brothers and sisters in this room and then online, what he is saying is stop your worship. Stop giving unto the Lord until you have reconciled with your brother he's saying this is an important aspect of worship is brotherly love stop immediately and go reconcile because your anger with each other damages your worship of your heavenly father so be reconciled one to another immediately and without haste and then Ephesians 4.32, which is on the heels of what I just read in Ephesians 4.31, says this. And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. We are to forgive one another and be compassionate to one another. Be unified one with another. And this is how we reconcile. We must get past our pride and get on our knees and ask forgiveness of our brother and sister. If you've never done that, you will find a moment of unrelenting joy and release to let your pride go and say, I am so sorry. And watch how God heals. So in this moment of invitation, in this moment of reflection, what I ask for you is this, O church, is there anyone you need to reconcile with today? Do not delay. Take this opportunity as we pray and as we sing one last stanza of a hymn to pray, O oh Lord, draw unto my mind that individual I need to reconcile with. And if you are here this morning and you do not know Jesus Christ, or if you are online and you do not know, you may be harboring bitterness and anger towards someone, and you don't know how to get past it. And that's because you're not reconciled unto Jesus Christ. And I promise you, if you reconcile unto Jesus Christ, he will open pathways for you to reconcile unto your family. How do I do this, you ask? It's simple. Repent of your sins. See your sin as God sees your sin. 
agree with him on it, and repent of them. Turn from them. Confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Confess that he died on the cross for your sin, was raised on the third day, and now sits at the mighty right hand of God. Cry out, O Lord, save me, and you will be saved. And I tell you today that your pathway to reconciliation with all of God's image on this earth, his created people, will begin. Let's pray.